on a field about 50 miles from Boston, Strawberry Hill, on the evening of September 3, 1880, history was made. It is unlikely the department store employees who were tossing around a ball knew that this game would still be talked about well over a century later. As the crowd took their seats, the ball players took their positions, the sun dipped below the horizon, and the moon rose. And then the lights came on to illuminate the field. It is said that the lights were as bright as 90,000 candles burning simultaneously. This was the first baseball game played at night under artificial light. Here's the story of that game and the history of baseball under the lights. While it is commonly said that Thomas Edison gave the world its first commercially produced electric lights, that is actually false. While Edison did produce the first commercially viable light bulb, there were other companies that were trying to compete in the industry at the same time, using various forms of electrical lighting. One of them was Boston's Northern Electric Light Company, using electric arc lamps and Western equipment. Englishman Edward Weston was a master electrician who began working with dynamos in the 1870s. In 1875, Weston patented rational construction construction of the dynamo. This allowed him to increase its efficiency from 45% to more than 90%. When he premiered his electric lamps using dynamo power at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876, attention was scarce. But that didn't deter him, and he moved to the U.S. permanently in 1877 to set up his own workshop in Newark, New Jersey, only 20 miles from Edison's lab in Menlo Park. Also a master marketer, he began putting up his electric arc lights around Newark, most prominently on Newark Fire Department's watchtower right in the center of town. This led to an influx of orders for his lamps, including for the city's military park in 1878 and Boston's Forest Garden in 1879. Now, it isn't exactly clear if Western Electric Light Company collaborated with the Northern Electric Light Company or whether they were branches of the same company, but either way, the companies excelled at marketing and publicity, and this September ball game was a perfect way to show off what Western equipment could do. The game was between well-known Boston department stores. As was the case back then, most professional teams were made up of employees who the company recruited and sometimes paid to win games as bragging rights, and they were owned by Jordan Marsh and R.H. White. Jordan Marsh & Company was regionally famous for its wide variety of wares and its blueberry muffins. R.H. White Company was Marsh's biggest competitor with a giant store downtown. They were able to play for a purse of $50, which is about $1,300 today, provided by the electric company. During the day of September the 3rd, the Northern Electric Light Company set up three wooden towers overlooking the field on Strawberry Hill, which laid on the shores of Nantasket Beach in Hull, Massachusetts. According to the Society for American Base baseball research, Sabre, the towers were erected 500 feet apart from one another in an equilateral triangle. Each one was 100 feet high with one row of 12 electrical lights, as described by the Boston Herald as of the Western patent. As advertised by the company, each light was supposed to match the light power of 2,500 candles. So, with three towers, 12 lights each, there was supposed to be the light of 90,000 candles in this limited area. Dynamo stores in the small shed were used to generate a, quote, motive power of 36 horses. As the Boston Herald noted, the electric light company wanted to show off what they could do and hopefully attract bigger and better clients, creating a model of the plan contemplated for lighting cities from overhead in vast areas, the estimate being that four towers to a square mile of area, each mounting lights aggregating 90,000 candle power, will suffice to flood the territory about with a light almost equal to midday. However, at the last moment, the department stores decided to forbid their employees from playing in the game. The reason is not known, but the players showed up anyway and played sub rosa, Latin for under the rose, or in secrecy in other words. This is why all accounts of the game do not mention the players' names or any descriptions about them. If the players had been found out, there would be a chance that they would no longer have a job. As recounted by the official scorer of the game 30 years after the fact, inexpedient for him to mention any of the names of players, as some of them may still be employed in these establishments, although a number of players were recruited from the various jobbing houses in the dry goods trade. It is not known how many fans exactly came out to the game. One account says about 300. Another account noted, with reporters added in, the number got closer to 500. Either way, it was pretty clear the fans came out not for the baseball, but for the light spectacle. In terms of the publicity of the game, it was a hit, but in practice, the quality of the game was not so hot. 
Complaints from reporters who attended the game appeared in the next day's newspapers, centering around the amount of light. Said the Herald, on account of the uncertain light resembling that of the moon at its full, the batting was weak and the pitchers were poorly supported. Baseball writer Preston Oram concluded that the light was quite imperfect and there were lots of errors made. The players had to bat and throw with caution. For the spectators, the game had little interest, as only the movements of the pitcher in general could be discerned, while the course of the ball eluded the vision of the watchers. None of the reporters believed the idea to be at all practical. The game was tied 16-16 after nine innings, but the two teams agreed to call it, perhaps out of fear that the enveloping darkness would bring with it a line drive off the head. Additionally, it was noted that the players didn't want to miss the last ferry to Boston, which was around 10 p.m. For their efforts, the electric company rewarded the players and officials of the game with a generous supper. For the next 50 years, there would be sporadic night baseball games using artificial lights. In 1883, a game was played in Fort Wayne, Indiana, in front of a couple of thousand fans. A few more happened, but all were considered little more than a novelty. In the 20th century, as electric lights became more mainstream, minor league baseball teams began hosting a night game or two per year, but it wouldn't be until May 24, 1935, when Major League Baseball had its first night game under the lights between the Philadelphia Phillies and the Cincinnati Reds at Cincinnati's Crossley Field. The home team won 2-1, but Clark Griffith, the owner of the Washington Senators, was skeptical, saying to a newspaper, there is no chance of night baseball ever being popular in the bigger cities. People there are educated to see the best there is and will stand for only the best. High-class baseball cannot be played at night under artificial light. Today, over 80% of Major League Baseball games are played at night under the lights. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below. Don't forget to subscribe. This is a new channel. It really does help. And as always, thank you for watching.